what is up youtube welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then just welcome to my channel go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed today's video is going to be about john wayne gacy the killer clown one of america's most prolific serial killers to date if you don't know his story already you're kind of you probably girl you've been living under a rock if you are new here and you don't know what's going on this video is one of seven that i am posting for the week of halloween my true crime videos is where i sit here tell you a true crime story that is crazy and insane and i do my makeup at the same time now typically i aim for the lesser known but equally or more crazy true crime stories but for the week of halloween i'm telling the ones that inspired some of the biggest horror films that you know and you may not have known are based off of true true events and true people so that's what's going on this week and mama is tired okay <laughs> i ain't gonna lie this is a lot of work but it's fun and i appreciate you so much for watching and if you are interested in hearing the story of john wayne gacy from my perspective and seeing how i got this look then just keep on watching john wayne gacy aka john jr aka jj actually nobody called him that to my knowledge i just I just called him that. Anywho, he was born in Chicago, Illinois on March 17, 1942. As a child, John was described as overweight and unathletic. I literally had nothing else or better to say about little John. He had two sisters he was very close to and he was also very close to his mother as well but he endured a very very difficult relationship with his father john senior was an alcoholic and he was very abusive to little john his sisters and his mother somebody else's story started out the exact same way i think it was it had to be ed Gein. throughout his childhood john struggled tremendously to gain approval and acceptance and love from his father who was constantly belittling him, constantly telling him why he wasn't good enough, comparing him to his sisters and saying, you know, things like he was dumb, stupid, that he never amounted to anything. Not only was he verbally abusive and emotionally abusive, he was physically abusive. He oftentimes beat little John for just pretty much nothing. What foundation am I going to use today? There was one instance where he took a broomstick and popped John over the head, knocked him unconscious. This happened to him as a child. He did all this to a kid, which my thing is this. This is what I don't understand. I'm just a pet parent and nobody's gonna come in my house and abuse Blue, okay? No one. I cannot imagine how it would feel with like a human child. Like, I don't understand that whole, yeah, it may be your kid too, but what you not gonna do is abuse my child. I don't understand why some women allow their children to be abused by the men in their life, father or not. It's unfathomable to me, cause you ain't gonna beat my child. John grew up feeling like he just would never be good enough for his father, but he always wanted to change that. Like he always wanted the approval and acceptance of his father. He would often cry to his sisters and mother about never being good enough in his father's eyes. They probably were like, man, fuck him. At least that's how I would be. So when John was just six years old, he stole a toy car from a local, like I think it was a local grocery store, some local store that had toy cars for sale. He stole one. His mother found out. She was very upset. She demanded that he return to the store, return the car and apologize to the store owners, which is what he did. But then she turned around and told his father, John Sr., which I don't understand. Cause if he just beating him for nothing, why would you give him reason but she does this and of course the father just goes in on john and just really beats him to the point that it makes the mother uncomfortable so she attempts to shield the child and john singer was like girl this made john singer very upset and so from that point on the mother decided that she was no longer going to allow him to abuse her child emotionally or physically she would always step in when the father was just doing too much this just made it worse on john jr his dad then started to call him a mama's boy he started to say that john was a sissy and that this would cause him to grow up gay <sighs> in 1949 when john was just seven years old him and another boy were caught fondling a little girl which we don't know if it was against our consent or not kids being into some some things 
I don't know if it was against her will, but nevertheless, they got in trouble for it because they shouldn't have been doing it anyway. John Singer took a razor strap and beat little John with it as punishment for these acts. That same year, John was molested himself by a friend of the family. I wouldn't call him a friend. He was a contractor who would take John for rides in his truck and then fondle him. Why was y'all letting y'all seven year old go ride off with a man in his truck? What was, what was the point of that? I don't understand. I don't understand. I, I don't make the news. I just report it. I'm just here to tell the story. That's what happened. John was afraid to tell his father because he thought that his dad would just blame him, say this was all his fault, and that, you know, you know, he was already calling him a little queer, so he probably would have flipped on him and be like, you the gay one? You did this. I don't know. He didn't feel comfortable letting his father know. Poor little John, thinking this is all his fault. That's kind of... It's kind of fucked up. Because of a heart condition, John was not allowed to play any sports in school. So it means dad was already on him about being a little pansy. And so this just made stuff worse. He was the average student without many friends at all. He was actually bullied a lot by both classmates and neighborhood kids. Because kids are cruel and, you know, assholes. Or they can be. Not all kids, you know. But they can be. Kids can be real cruel. To make matters worse for little John, he would assist the school truancy officer with whatever school truancy officers do. He also would run a lot of errands for the teachers and the school staff. And so, yeah, he wasn't all that popular with the kids, okay? They, they didn't like him. They did not like that at all. About fourth grade, John began to have these episodes well, these blackouts and seizures, he would have to be hospitalized. He estimated that between the ages of 14 and 18, he had spent about a year in the hospital. John's father did not believe it. He said that he just wanted attention and he did all this to gain sympathy from people. Now, although his mother and his sisters, they never doubted his illness at all. They just were there for him. Like you should be his family, but his condition was never officially diagnosed, so we don't know if homeboy was faking or not, honestly. John had a friend in high school who, after everything went down, recounted events where he would come over to the house and witness the dad beat him for no reason. He said he would often witness John Sr. belittling him just out of nowhere. I guess he was drunk and he just had to take off his anger on somebody. So he would just show up out of nowhere and start yelling at little John and cursing at him, beating on him. He said that John never raised his hands to retaliate. He would raise his hands to like shield the blows, but he never fought his dad back. He never retaliated, never got smart, never did none of this stuff. I probably would have done because you would have had me messed up, okay? <sighs> At the age of 18, John got a job as an assistant precinct captain for a Democratic Party. He thought that this little fancy position was going to like make his father think like, oh, you smart. You smart. You loyal. You are grateful. I appreciate that. But it kind of backfired because being just like the assistant, the dad was just like, you're just an errand boy, a patsy. He didn't respect it at all. He felt like it wasn't a respectable position, being another man's assistant. That same year, John himself became a Democratic candidate in his you know, neighborhood. His father respected that a little bit more. He actually bought little john a car but he put it in his own name and he had little john making the payments ain't that crazy trying to boost his little credit no sir you ain't sweet over the years that it took john to pay off the car john senior would you know confiscate the keys he just he just didn't want to love his son he needed a reason to i don't know what it is like take out his whatever it is his anger hurt frustrations whatever on little john get angry and confiscate the keys and little john will be walking everywhere he needed to go or catching the bus eventually he got tired of his father's shit and was like you know what i can take the power by leaving you 
and everything you own behind. So he was like, you know what? I'm leaving. I'm moving out. You can have this piece of shit car. John packed up and left and moved to Vegas. And for three months, he worked as an attendant at a mortuary. He would sleep in a cot behind the embalming room. He would often watch the morticians embalming the bodies. He was very interested in that. Very, very weird of him to be. On one evening, after everybody had gone for the night, he climbed into the coffin with the body of a teenage boy and he laid there caressing him and rubbing his body admiring him in his morbid beauty he claimed that that night he experienced a level of shock or like extreme pleasure that disturbed him so much that the next day he got up and he called his mother to see if his dad would allow him to come back home which his father agreed to allowing him to come back home and so he left Vegas behind. In 1964, he, after returning home, took a job at a local shoe store as a manager. There he met and became engaged to a lovely young lady by the name of Marilyn Myers, who worked in the department that he managed. He was getting his honey where he was getting his money, and that's unacceptable. But that's just what happened. The couple met in March and were married in September of that same year. Her father was apparently very excited. Her family, she came from a pretty well-off family. When they got married, her father purchased three KFCs for them to manage and make money off of. So they moved to Waterloo, Iowa. And him and her worked together managing the restaurants. Marilyn's family vacated their home for the couple to move into. Just two years later, the family welcomes a son and then one year after that, they welcome a daughter. And John says that this part of his life was perfect. He said that he had finally gained the long sought after approval of his father, who, you know, thought he was doing pretty good for himself. His parents visited the home of John and his new wife. His father actually apologized for all of the things he had done, all of the abuse and told him that he was quote unquote i was wrong about you son he apologized for making his childhood a living hell and decided you know hey let's just move forward and forget about all that huh he and marilyn had a seemingly perfect life in iowa but under the surface gary's monster still lurked he was still alive and well you know the one that felt that shock after he climbed into the casket with a 14 year old corpse that one. Gacy attempted to appease that monster by joining a swingers club that participated in wife swapping, drugs, prostitution, pornography. But none of these things satisfied, you know, his his deepest desires. John started up a business in his basement and he would only employ teenage boys. Like all of his employees were of the male teenage persuasion, which is odd. It was only a matter of time before John was accused of sexually assaulting a couple of the young teenagers. They claimed that John had lured them to his basement under false pretenses or like with the promise of a job and then attempted to sexually assault them. He pled guilty to one count and not guilty to the rest. He was like, I might have done one, but I ain't do them all. He was sentenced to 10 years because of this and soon after he went to jail. See, Marilyn was like me. I told y'all before, if you go to jail for longer than the weekend, I ain't nobody's down ass bitch, okay? I'm leaving you. She served him divorce papers after he went to jail. She was like, I'm out of here. You out here raping on little boys. I didn't sign up for this. Now granted, she was a freak because like I said, they joined the swingers club, but she wasn't up for all of that. So she left, she dipped, Britney style. Now just 18 months after him being in prison, he was released on good behavior as a model inmate. He was a good boy. And so they said, you know what? Let's just let him go. He never saw little Marilyn again. She wasn't with it. She moved on with her life. She was the best decision she could have made. Now, during his stint of community service he meets his second wife carol hoff 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 carol hoff and they're doing their community service thing you know starting a life together now while he was in prison he became quite the little artist he developed this character pogo the clown right he would draw all of these photos and weird 
illustrations of this character Pogo the Clown. He joined the Jolly Joker Club who would perform for children's hospitals, birthday parties, it's like clowns and things of that nature. He taught himself how to apply clown makeup and he became Pogo the Clown. Now at first it was alright because you know he's doing fundraisers, kids, events and stuff and it's like normal but then homeboy started to show up around town at like bars and stuff dressed as Pogo the Clown and people were like <sighs> his infatuation with Pogo the Clown and then his history with teenage boys led Carol to question his sexuality after which Gacy or John because I've been calling him John all this time up to now so John admitted to being bisexual he said okay I'm, I'm interested in both okay you got me. Now Carol was not supportive of this. She said she wasn't down with it. So she immediately divorced him and left him alone in the house. Though she denied knowledge of what was to come, later she admitted to seeing him bringing boys into their basement late at night. She said she didn't know what he was doing with them. She was like, uh-uh, that's, that's all I know. That's all I saw. Now at first, Gacy was luring boys, young boys to his home with ads, advertising work, but I guess that source started to dry up, so he had to resort to other things. He met 16-year-old Timothy Jack McCoy at a Greyhound bus terminal. He was traveling from Mission, Michigan to Omaha on a sightseeing tour and he was in between buses so or maybe they had stopped for whatever reason his bus his next bus wouldn't be there till the next day john picked him up and was like hey you can come to my house for the night it'll be fun the 16 year old boy trusted him and he went home with john and this is where things get a little little strange because according to john right they go home spend the night he was going to drive the boy back to the bus station in the morning but according to him, all right, my camera died right when I was putting on my other lash. Now, according to Gacy, when he woke up the following morning, the 16-year-old McCoy was standing in his doorway with a large kitchen knife in his hand. Gacy said that this scared him, so he leaped from his bed toward the teenager. And at that point, he raised his hands in order to, like, surrender and, like, you know, like, let him know that he didn't mean him any harm. When he did that, the knife cut his forearm. He had the scar on his arm to prove, you know, at some point he was cut. Now, we don't know if that's how it happened, but he said it's how it happened. He had a cut consistent with his story. He said that he then twisted the knife from McCoy's wrist and banged his head against the bedroom wall because he was still under the impression that the teenager meant to come and try to stab him and kill him in his sleep. At this point, the teenager starts to fight back. He kicks him in the stomach. And then Gacy being the stronger of the two, gets the best of him, they fight a little bit. Gacy straddles him, takes the kitchen knife and begins stabbing him in his chest, killing him. And Gacy then said that after this, he went to the kitchen and that is where he saw an open carton of eggs and a slab of unsliced bacon on the counter. The table had also been set for two and he realized that McCoy had actually began to make the two breakfast and that he was most likely coming to wake him for breakfast that he'd made not to kill him so Gacy decided it was best to bury the child in the crawl space of his home and then he covered that with a slab of concrete and just acted like nothing ever happened in an interview with the police after his arrest Gacy later said that after killing McCoy, he felt a mind-numbing orgasm followed by feeling completely like totally drained and it was that point that he realized that killing was the ultimate thrill. In January 1974, John Wayne Gacy aka Pogo the Clown met a 14 year old brown haired boy who has been unidentified. Met an unidentified brown haired 14 year old boy whom he lured back to his home, strangled and stuffed in a closet. Now he said that he went back to check on the boy a couple days later and saw that there, there was this strange fluid leaking from his nose and mouth and it began to stain his carpet and he said that at that point he decided that it would be best to stuff his young victim's underwear into their mouths to avoid this going forward. He buried this victim in his own backyard only a couple of feet away from his barbecue grill because he nasty. John Wayne Gacy went on to murder 
30 young boys. Some were unidentified teenagers, drifters from out of town. Some were local boys who worked for Gacy. Gacy even participated in the searches for these boys because he was friendly with the family because everybody loved Pogo the clown, okay? But they didn't know what Pogo was doing down there in his home with these young boys. He was considered a helpful and loved member of the community. His arrest came after a 15 year old boy was last seen entering Gacy's house and he had told people that he was going there to inquire about a job posting and then he was never seen again. Police investigated Gacy and searched his home and there they found a glass ring of the 15 year old boy along with child size clothing. Upon further investigation they found 29 bodies that have been buried underneath Gacy's home. He was then arrested and three years after that he, I don't know why it took three years, but three years in after he was actually arrested, I guess they were going through the trial and stuff. He pled not guilty by reason of insanity, which they all typically like to try to do. The jury didn't buy it. He was given 12 death sentences. And after that, he dropped the family facade that he had carried all through the trial he was still presenting himself as nice friendly pogo it wasn't me don't know how these bodies got here but it wasn't me because i'm nice friendly pogo who makes like balloon animals but after he was convicted he was like you know what fuck all of that and fuck y'all he dropped the facade of the friendly clown and he spent 14 years awaiting his execution date. And y'all know on his execution day when his last meal was, he ordered a bucket of fried chicken from KFC. That was what he wanted his last meal to be. He returned to his roots because you know he was the manager at KFC with his first wife. The killer clown's last words before his execution were, quote unquote, kiss my ass. Though Gacy is long gone, his legacy lives on. He has had plenty of movies inspired by him. It, mostly all of the killer clown, like the whole killer clown theme came from him. Most of the victims that were retrieved from underneath his home were returned to the families for proper burial. Up until July 2017, the investigators were still working to identify some of the bodies. The last one was identified then, but sadly his family had already died and like there was no one that they could find that could give him a proper burial. That's very sad. Six of Gacy's victims remain unidentified and I'm not quite sure if they're still working to identify them or if the case is closed or not, but all of it is just sad. Now his sister actually did an episode for Investigation Discovery this year, this year. Cause John Wayne Gacy is like, everybody knows John Wayne Gacy the killer clown. He is very, very popular he's up there with like ted bundy jeffrey dahmer like he's like in the top five most prolific well-known serial killers ever you can check that the episode out the tv show is called evil lives here i believe the episode i know for sure is called you know my brother's name and she just gives her side of how it was growing up with John Wayne Gacy being her brother. She said that the family had no clue that he was doing any of this they knew him as sweet innocent little john he was always loving they were completely blindsided by the accusations it hit the news like somebody called her up and was like girl you see your brother on the news and she like girl what and she turns to channel five and there her brother is in handcuffs and then body after body is being brought from out the house she continued a relationship with him i don't want to give it away check out the episode she continued a relationship with him up until a certain point she loved her brother because she she didn't know him as the killer clown. She only knew him as her brother. So I'm sure that was tough for her because I love my siblings. And then somebody all of a sudden is just like, they've been killing all these people. I'd be like, but they were nice to me. That pretty much wraps up this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed the look. If you did, don't forget to give it a thumbs up on your way out. Share the video. Comment down below. Let me know what your thoughts are. Subscribe if you have not. As always, thank you so much for watching. And I will see you in the next one. Peace. You know what? Y'all can't, you know, I used to think people who were afraid of clowns were kind of like, but y'all really can't blame them because obviously clowns can't be trusted.